YouTube keeps asking me how poverty can be so widespread in the richest country in the world. It's a great question. No one ever taught me where wealth or poverty come from in school. The other videos make great points, but I wonder if they're bogged down in details and don't clearly display the big picture. That's why I'm here. The thing about wealth and poverty is they're two sides of the same coin, each indispensable to the other. Where there's wealth, there's poverty somewhere nearby. I'm Chris and welcome back to the show for the video essay, Connoisseur. I made a video a couple of years ago about how calling the US or anywhere the richest country in the world doesn't necessarily mean anything, which was an enormous success. I don't like to repeat myself, so I'm going to make different points here. If you want more detail or some books you can read on the topic, check the links in the description or ask me in the comments. First thing to understand is a country isn't a family where everyone shares in whatever the patriarch brings home. If it were, GDP might mean something for you personally, but it doesn't. A country is a state with millions of people under its rule. A country is the property of the class that rules that part of the world. Once you understand that, things should get clearer. It should explain why no one besides the rich have any power to affect the decisions made and imposed on everyone by law, because that's who my country works for. Second thing to understand is how wealth is created. To hear the wealthy talk, you would think you just come up with a good idea, then do some work, and it just becomes a million dollars. If that were true, everyone would be able to get rich. But wealth is created collectively by millions of workers, alive and long dead. Now, why did they work? Why did they create that wealth just to have it stolen from them by the people at the top of the hierarchy who claimed to own it? Because they were forced to. I'm not just talking about slavery. Slavery in fields, factories, and prisons has always been integral to capitalism and certainly is today. But a less well-known but equally significant phenomenon is original expropriation. I've talked about this in the links in the description, but it basically means taking shit away from people so they're forced to work for you. So let's say you have a bit of land around your home, not much, but enough to support you and your family. Then one day the local Lord just takes it from you. He says you can have food from the land, but from now on you have to pay money. What do you do? A lot of people fight back and a lot of people die, but if you don't want to risk your life, the only thing you can do to survive is work for the people who have all the money. This is original expropriation. It's happened in every part of the world you can name, maybe several times, and as a result, today the world is one big propertyless labor market that conforms to the demands of capital. You might know the history of original expropriation in the U.S., the so-called richest country in the world. Natives had their land taken from them. African people were taken from their land. Indentured servants came from Europe and Asia. This is how all that wealth was created, taking away people's land and freedom and telling them to work. That wealth was invested and passed down through a small capitalist class who reinvested it. Everyone else worked. Most of them all day, every day, creating more wealth for people who already had enough to live for 200 years. Today, the U.S. no longer has legal slavery, but the wealth created by stolen people on stolen land created corporations, landlords, banks, and governments who demand you work. If you don't work, you don't eat, and hungry people don't need to be whipped. What's that? You don't have to get a job? What else could you do? There's all this land you could cultivate or forage on, but it's all privately owned. There's all this food just there in the supermarket, but it's owned by the corporation, so you can have it if you push papers around or make some equally valuable contribution for most of your waking time. So you work. But your work might not be enough. 
Hierarchical societies are designed to take from the many at the bottom and give to the few. We've looked at original expropriation, but there are other ways we get robbed. What about inflation? The price of goods keeps rising, so we can buy fewer goods, which at some point means less food and medicine. The price of rent keeps increasing, which is terrifying because it makes it ever more likely we'll end up living on the street. We might have to get two jobs just to avoid that fate, which might be super stressful. Stress is really bad for your health, and you need your health to work. But take solace! Your work is creating wealth for someone, not for you, for your landlord, your bosses, their shareholders, and those of the corporations you have to buy from. You're making them wealthy. Not only will they be able to do whatever they want with their own lives, they'll be able to buy politicians, judges, police chiefs, and PR firms, so you won't fight back. All they require is your time, energy, physical, and mental health. So the reason there are all these rich people is there is so much poverty. So much has been taken from so many people and concentrated in the hands of so few that we now have this huge wealth gap. Of course there are so many homeless people, there are so many rich landlords. Of course there's so much hunger and malnutrition, all the food is owned by huge corporations. Of course so many people are in so much debt when governments and businesses keep borrowing and then passing the costs on to you. You can explain more social phenomena this way. Prisons are the effects of poverty and wealth, so of course there are such high incarceration rates. First, so many people get imprisoned for doing what they can to survive, like stealing or selling drugs. Second, thanks to the multi-billion dollar prison labor industry and its lobbyists. Of course there's so much xenophobia. If most migration is criminalized, people in the country illegally can be hired with no protections at really low wages. The more poor people there are, the more people are desperate to work for any wage on offer. The more wealth they create for the least pay, the more the owners of their labor can take. How could the richest country in the world create such poverty? How could it not? All right, that's the problem. Now, what are we going to do about it? Giving more money to people sounds like it could work until you consider when the landlord and the corporation and the state see people have more money, they raise their prices and take it. The most peaceful and legal solution to a widening wealth gap that I can think of is if the government started taking from the rich and giving to the poor. If the state were to implement wide-ranging measures designed to revitalize communities, shelter people, provide health care and social safety nets for everyone, including the people in the country illegally, plus it decriminalized drugs and stopped building so many prisons, then poverty would drop and the relative power of the rich would drop. And that's why I don't think it's about to happen anytime soon. Not unless we organize. Historically, agitating for revolution was the way to wheedle concessions out of the ruling class. You go on strike and you get a raise, maybe two more whole dollars an hour. You threaten to overthrow capitalism, like anarchists and trade unionists and others in the early 20th century, and you get the New Deal and an end to child labor, if there are enough of you anyway. If some of us cause disruption and destruction, we can at least slow down the endless accumulation of wealth. If some of us steal back corporate property, we at least redistribute a little wealth. And the more we do, the more we inspire others. But alongside direct action, we need to take care of each other. Poverty is going to increase, and so will the budgets of the police to enforce it. We should recognize that most of us are in the same boat, so we can create arrangements of mutual aid. If you think mutual aid means sending people money online, mostly doesn't. It means treating others as equals, taking care of each other as equals, and pooling skills and resources so we don't have to go it alone. You might have people doing these things where you live. If you don't, you might be able to contribute something online. You can still help out. You can still be a part of a group making things better. All right, that's it for me. See you in a week or two.